Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, MCPOD and to our uh, webinar looking at um, a picture of health. This report, is, as I'm sure many of you know, is really the counterpart to a report that was done back in uh, 2017, Treat at One. Uh, and I'm going to use this phrase because I think it's probably correct. You know, we're, we're looking at the two sides of the fence. And I say that quite deliberately because what's apparent from this study is there still are barriers between uh, mental health care and physical health care. And we're going to explore uh, some of those and the implications today uh, in this meeting. Hi, I'm Natasha Robinson and I was the proposer of the study. I'm not a mental health professional. In fact, I was a career anaesthetist for 35 years in a DGH. Uh, and latterly, I was associate medical director for uh, clinical governance with responsibility for audit and clinical quality. And it was while I was uh, in that post that a, a colleague and I undertook a study uh, where we were looking at um, diagnosis uh, in inpatients and length of stay. And we became aware that within our inpatient population, we had a surprisingly high incidence of mental health uh, illness. Um, across the spectrum of, of, of mental health conditions uh, alongside substance misuse and also uh, mental health what problems within learning disability uh, and also, uh, of course, uh, dementia. And uh, although we had a mental health unit at the other end of town and also uh, right across the road, a very large uh, mental health inpatient unit um, right next door, accessing expert help uh, to help manage these patients was difficult um, due to the separation of the services uh, and we recognised that in the acute sector we really didn't have the right skills to help these patients. Now this observation resulted in the 2017 NCPOD study Treat as One which looked at how we care for adults with significant mental disorder uh, when they're admitted to a general hospital. Whilst working on that study, um, I came to recognise that the converse was also true and that inpatients in mental health facilities weren't able to access the same level of care for their physical health needs as those in a general hospital, again due to the separation of services. And it was also apparent to me that those patients transferred to my DGH from a local mental health unit, uh, there was a a need for greater support to help meet their day-to-day -day physical health needs than was in place. And, and this is despite the fact that the literature confirms that the presence of a serious mental health disorder shortens life by decades due to the high prevalence mostly of long-term conditions and especially cardiorespiratory disorders. Uh, and there's also a considerable body of authoritative guidance on the need to address intercurrent physical illnesses in these patients. Uh, at this point in my career, I moved post to join a group setting up a QI service in a mental health community trust. And this gave me a wonderful opportunity to understand the problem from within and from the other side. Um, perhaps I can give you a few examples of the system problems that we focused upon. Uh, firstly, in an older adult unit, nearly 50% of patients were taking medication that required monitoring. Absence of on-site laboratory facilities made some of this very difficult because of delays in receiving results. And of course, unlike in a, a general hospital, there were no specialist nurses uh, for, say, anticoagulation or COPD to advise on dosing. The problem was very often left to very junior doctors uh, and maybe the, those from the on-call team. A second area was in uh, a working age adult ward uh, where the tobacco smokers were accompanied by ward staff to smoke off the premises, which as it happened was on the street. This wasn't a good use of staff and a missed opportunity for health improvement because although a smoking cessation policy existed, this wasn't being proactively implemented. And the last area that I looked at was the use of news scoring uh, on the ward. Um, staff did it, they recorded it, but they really hadn't been made aware of how to use it to identify a deteriorating patient. Now, all of this sounds as though I'm criticising the staff, but actually my point is, 
really that we know these problems can be addressed if better systems are in place and the staff empowered to use them effectively. Now, I realise that inpatient treatment for mental health illness is only the tip of the iceberg for those whose mental health needs uh, actually bring them into hospital. But hospital stays are often of sufficient length to enable the patient's general health to be actively managed in the hope that they can leave hospital as fit as possible in every way. And my hope is that for those patients who are admitted for mental health care, this study will bridge the gap between theory and practice in identifying what actions are needed to achieve this outcome. Thank you so much, Natasha. Um, my name is Mary Doherty. I'm a liaison psychiatrist, and it's fantastic to be here this afternoon. And it's been really fantastic to see the attendee list. And I think Vivek and I, we can't talk about the study with at least making an acknowledgement of the amount of work that went in it. So our results, that period of which we were going through data and doing case reviews happened pretty much right in the middle of COVID. And that meant that we had to transfer a methodology used by NCPOD for many, many years into an online format. And what that meant was that the case reviewers, um, and many of you are in the room, I can see some of you here, um, had to adapt and had to work with us. It made it twice as hard um, and sometimes a little bit less fun. So it, we just wanted to acknowledge the, the testimony to the huge number of people, um, all driven by passion, which is what links it to N Natasha, that this is a topic that um, those of you who are interested in it, either whether you've been trying to support improvements in physical health for some time, or maybe you're new and you've just started to, to look into this area, um, there's a key theme that weaves through that in order to do this well within our current systems and provide good physical health care, it does rely on you having some passion and seeing the importance of this topic. So as Ian said, we are going to go sort of information light a little bit in this um, webinar and hopefully leave lots of time for questions and give you some of the headlines and hopefully create um, enough time for some, some conversations about the sorts of things that we found. I would strongly recommend you do read the report. As I said, there's a huge amount of work, but also care that went into that. And what Vivek and I wanted to do is talk you through sort of some of the headline recommendations, noting that there are many more within the report to read. Um, but also we wanted to make sure that we didn't just focus on where there were problems, because as much as we've got a very mixed picture of what the quality of physical health care is within mental health hospitals, we also saw some real pockets of excellence and some areas where we could really learn lessons and hopefully try and transfer those pockets of excellence to more systematised ways of approaching physical health care and mental health hospitals. So the first recommend the recommendation that I'm going to talk about is um, the, um, our summary of making sure that we assess patients for acute physical health conditions on arrival at the mental health inpatient setting, but also then undertake a detailed physical health assessment once the patient is admitted. And this recommendation highlights the importance really of a two-stage approach, which we don't think before has really been teased out within the various guidance that exists. And this two stages approach is about recognizing the real risk for people with mental health problems of having an acute illness at the point at which they arrive into a mental health inpatient setting. Um, many of the conditions that for those of us who are mental health professionals here um, will be aware of that we care for can be associated with significant periods of self neglect when you become unwell psychiatrically. And that self-neglect can have consequences such as dehydration, um, malnutrition, higher risk of infection. So the first aspect of this recommendation really highlights the importance of looking for those acute issues that should be addressed um, immediately, whether that be within the inpatient setting or transferred. The second part of the recommendation is around ensuring that a more comprehensive assessment after that initial assessment is carried out. And this has been a recommendation in previous RC, RC site guidance for some time, but interestingly, not specifically detailed as to what that comprehensive assessment entails. And we found within the study, and again, this is all detailed in the report, a real variation as to what we saw a comprehensive physical health assessment included. There was pretty much consensus on physical health observations, but once you moved further into preventative interventions, such as checking that people um, were engaged with immunization programs or inquiry about sexual and reproductive health, there started to be huge variation um, across the cases that we reviewed. Overall, we found a mixed picture. 
we found that about 20% of patients didn't have an initial assessment. The other really interesting factor in terms of who is carrying out these assessments is that we found about 50% of these physical health assessments are carried out by out of hours doctors. And that has a significant implication because that means that those initial bits of information, that initial primary assessment as to how safe is this patient, what do we need to do immediately to support them, is often, is often um, potentially um, reduced through handovers and transfers. So the night doctor writing some notes that may or may not be picked up by the day doctor in complete assessments and a difficulty in following that through. Um, within the, the case, um, within our report, I think we gave um, the, what was an important example about a lady who whom a breast lump was missed, and this is a lady who had no fixed abode, um, no regular um, primary care um, doctor, and this was a real opportunity to do something about that, but it seemed what was what the case review was interpreted from the notes is that that out of hours process without good handover to a day doctor and all of that care landing on one person led to that potentially being missed with potential significant consequences. So, as I said, we found a mixed picture, but we also found some pockets of excellence. And I wanted to describe um, one case that, again, just had really stood out. And this was, it was a 47-year-old lady who had schizophrenia, and she'd been admitted with a deterioration in her psychosis and quite significant self-neglect. And on top of that self-neglect, she already had poorly controlled diabetes and COPD. And case reviewers identified this as a particularly um, well-done assessment First of all, because there were several attempts to carry out that assessment. Often people will raise the concern as to, well, you know, it's very hard to do um, physical health assessments when people with significant mental health problems come into hospital because they can't engage with it or they don't understand what's going on. And what the case review was noted through these notes was that um, repeated attempts were made and repeated thoughtful attempts were, were made. And that enabled the out of hours doctor to complete an assessment. They demonstrated flexibility, they'd come back to the ward after the patient had had something to eat, for example. Um, so that process of engagement and carrying out the assessment was particularly important. The other thing that stood out with this particular practice was that two aspects of the patient's needs were considered, both the acute risks that they faced from the fact that they had been self-neglecting um, and were at greater risk of dehydration and also um, worrying glycemic control, but they also considered complications from their disease. So they thought about their renal function and prescribing and made notes to this effect. Um, they considered um, what their level of COPD care was like and whether they had respiratory failure. Um, and they made then what felt particularly important, a particular plan for escalation. And I think um, Vivek's going to talk about this a little bit more of what a good quality care plan looked like. But specifically, they said um, what parameters, um, if this patient deteriorated, um, would trigger an escalation. Something, again, that stood out from this assessment was that they identified where there were gaps and they put a name and responsibility in the notes of who was to follow them up. So, for example, where pharmacy was to follow something up, where the day doctor was to follow something up. They'd noted that there had been missed appointments linked to the person's poor control of their diabetes and had made contact with secondary care. And they also importantly talked to the carer and they found out that actually there was additional physical health problems that they weren't aware of when admitted and managed to get a CPAP machine brought in for the patient's sleep apnea. And this, again, a standout point throughout this case was the involvement of family. So taking the time to talk to family, learning about learning from the family, how they could best engage the patient who was really quite mentally unwell. Um, but also they demonstrated within the notes, within support, um, and information given to them. What was care like that is being given and the summary from our perspective is that it was flexible it was thoughtful but it was so rigorous paying attention to both the risks for the patients and I'm going to pass it to the importance of care plans. Um, Sorry Vivek just before you do that could I just remind everybody please to go on to mute because there is a bit of background noise thanks very much. I should have said that I'm an acute medicine consultant I'm not a psychiatrist uh, I work at Geyser St. Thomas's Hospital, but I have an interest in the interface of physical and mental health uh, uh, care. So the second uh, topic we wanted to touch upon today was uh, around the recommendation we made that uh, hospitals should create a physical health care plan for patients admitted to a mental health inpatient setting. And to me, uh, this was really important 
in some ways, a plan includes two things, an assessment, a good assessment, which then gives you a list of things to look at, and then thinking about what to anticipate, what might go wrong, and how we prepare for that. And that's your plan, in addition to obviously finding what's not working at the moment, what are the current health issues, whether they are physical or mental health related, and what needs to be done immediately, but also to start thinking about what could go wrong and what needs to be done for that. Um, in, in physical health setups, I think uh, this is sort of drilled into people during their training um, with, with lots of very good tools available. And I think uh, on the mental health aspect, especially mental health nursing aspect, uh, there's not enough, we believe, uh, physical health training to be able to do all these three things at the same time, uh, at the first uh, encounter with our patient. And I thought I'll take this example to highlight some of those points that I've just made. Um, this is a 56 year old male who was admitted because of deteriorating mood and experiencing some suicidal ideation. There were other issues also obviously by background. And he also had a fairly extensive physical health history that included heart disease, uh, renal disease, et cetera. Uh, what's commendable is of course that during initial assessment, uh, the history emerged uh, at this point that uh, the patient had been having a headache for three months, for which, for various reasons, nothing much had been done so far. And uh, the planning at this stage, which clearly needs to be highlighted, is that the mental health team took upon themselves to for, uh, work out what was going on and what needed to be done. There was a clear previous history of lung cancer, and therefore the indication of a possible metastatic disease. Uh, they got the patient to the right people across in the physical health hospital, where a CT scan revealed a metastasis to the brain. Um, the, what's in the quotations in there is what case reviewers said, um, that the patient was managed very well. There was effective chasing of uh, scan results, and communication with the physical health team. And, and we know that good communication across two, two sites is never easy, but it was done in this case. What, uh, where the story ends is slightly um, uh, sort of depressing in the sense that the patient eventually passed away requiring palliative care. But what this highlights is that treatment was changed. The patient used to be on furosemide for uh, heart disease that was promptly switched because in this case, the cerebral edema is much better managed with dexamethasone. Uh, the treatment of heart failure and kidney failure was suitably modified uh, with uh, a good discussion with the patient and family so that realistic goals were set around what are we trying to achieve as far as the physical health care of this patient is concerned. And right through with the involvement of the palliative care team, uh, uh, the patient had a very smooth transition out of uh, hospital into a palliative care facility where they passed away in a dignified way that they would have liked to have. Um, the, there were a few issues around uh, MDT working, and I would say that is clearly not something we would expect in any mental health setup to have a, a physiotherapist and an occupational therapist and everything else that would be focused on this patient's physical health care. So there's always scope for improvement, I would say. But the fact that uh, a lot of the investigation and treatment and care planning for this patient was uh, managed while the patient was receiving their mental health treatment in their primary place of stay is really commendable. And I think is a very good example of how we should be looking after our patients working together. Um, uh, the other thing to highlight in this case was initially when the patient was approached and they probably anticipated that something uh, really sinister was going on as far as their headache was concerned. Uh, they actually refused the MRI, uh, possibly saying, um, uh, you know, they didn't really want to know the diagnosis. And again, the engagement of staff, bringing the right people from across the road, from physical health, to get them to consent to an MRI, uh, obviously, here we are thinking about capacity and all the other aspects that go into this. Uh, coming up with the right outcome in collaboration with the patient, getting the MRI, getting the result, and then creating a plan that went through with very good physical and mental health care planning. 
I think is, is a key highlight in this case. Uh, the next uh, recommendation was around formalizing clinical networks and pathways between mental health care and physical health care. And as you can imagine, this sort of follows up from the previous recommendation. If we've created a good plan, a good plan may not be of any use if the right pathways don't exist already. And in some ways you could flip it around and say, if you had a good pathway in place, it really helps physical health and mental health teams uh, formulate a plan and take it to its uh, logical end because there's a pathway to guide us through that process. And during the study, we found multiple examples where the lack of a pathway or even the ability to pick up the phone and speak to a colleague across the road meant that quality of care from a physical health aspect uh, was compromised. Uh, there's a whole chapter on readmissions and uh, you would have seen there uh, that more than 50% of patients had more than two readmissions between physical and mental health care. And there, those were examples of where clearly there was not a joined up approach, there were no pathways and patients were being bounced from hospital to hospital. Uh, but I thought what we needed to look at, and again, there are some uh, things that did not go well in the patient I'm going to describe now, but there were some things that really came together because of the existence of a good way of transferring patients across. So this is a 78 year old patient with recurrent depressive episodes brought into hospital for a planned ECT. Again, uh, there was a more complex history uh, that I'm not highlighting here. Uh, but the key thing was that during their assessment, uh, this is part of the initial and comprehensive assessment, they were noted to be short of breath on multiple occasions. And clearly that raised the concern that there were some significant physical health problems that uh, had not been addressed uh, so far. And so the patient was transferred seamlessly to the local emergency department. What followed was not ideal physical health treatment. And uh, I guess I, I can say that being a physical health uh, specialist. Um, that the patient who had presented with shortness of breath uh, was returned with a diagnosis of urinary tract infection with a course of antibiotics. Uh, when, he, when the patient arrived back, the mental health team clearly was still concerned that the patient didn't look okay as far as the cardiorespiratory system was concerned. They were still short of breath. Uh, digging through the notes, so, so here we highlight one good thing, which was the exchange of information in terms of notes was pretty good. What did not happen is of course, the physical health team did not comment on the fact that the chest X-ray was abnormal with a pleural effusion, but the mental health team did pick it up because of the pathway. So it's a bit of a, a back and forth, but I think what it highlighted was a good pathway that shared information meant that what was missed in the physical health hospital was picked up by the mental health specialists. And they said, there is a pleural effusion, this patient's short of breath, we still don't know what's really going on. Could you please have a look at it again? So the patient returns to the emergency department, is diagnosed then to have a pulmonary embolism and the right treatment was started. Uh, so yes, that transfer should not have been required, but the system held through because of the existence of, of good networking and pathways. So he was, he was diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism, started on the right treatment and then returned in a much better physical health state. Uh, there were other issues in this, uh, in this patient's treatment. They also had some uh, abdominal pain, possibility of, of intestinal obstruction, uh, but all that was dealt with thanks to the existence of a, of a path pathway that allowed seamless transfer of patient across these two sites. Thank you, Vivek. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna just conclude with summarizing um, the fourth recommendation. And our fourth recommendation, there's two aspects to it really. One's about opportunity and one's about who do you need on your team to deliver good care. So the recommendation is around involving patients and their carers, their friends, their family in their physical health care and using the admission as an opportunity to assess and involve patients in their general health. And this is a recommendation that when we looked across all of our examples of where really good care had happened, when something, something seemed to have happened that was above and beyond, that was good care in spite of systems that don't help us do our jobs, it tended to be two factors. 
And one of the factors was people maybe going above and beyond or being innovative, trying something different. But the other factor was the involvement of patients and their carers, friends and family, and seeing them as critical parts of a care team, not spectators, not subjects of care, but a part of a team. Um, what was fascinating going through the report and, and going through the, the data returns and looking at the organizational survey that we carried out, was that a large number of, of trusts and health boards, they do indeed have physical health um, strategies. That's excellent. And actually most of them have also got um, executive um, accountability, which is also brilliant. However, not all of them had a specific objective within those strategies to make sure that they involved carers, friends and families in physical health care. And in addition to that, when we looked at some of the more qualitative data that came through from our patient and carer um, surveys, it was very evident that at least 50%, if not more carers, felt that they'd had absolutely no information about their loved one's physical health. Um, and this is important. This is important because if we looked at the case sample that we had, about 65 or more percent of individuals that, whose cases were reviewed by our teams um, were there admitted under a section of the Mental Health Act. And a large number of patients at that first point of assessment were determined not to have immediate capacity to look after themselves. And that feels particularly important that if you're in an institution where things are being done to you, no doubt for the best reasons to ensure that you're kept safe, that those sorts of interventions, those sorts of investigations, blood tests, results um, are not shared with your team. And of course, there's difficulties if, if people admitted um, to hospital at that time, or perhaps ever don't consent for information to be shared with them about with their families. But what really stood out in the surveys we got was that despite the fact that patients had consented and despite the fact that families were desperate to know what was going on for their loved one, um, information wasn't consistently shared. Um, and that's important because we remember that when the door, when you're discharged from the ward, that's where the family and the carer and the friends kick in. That's your support team. Mental health play an important but a limited role overall in someone's life who has a chronic disease, a long-term condition, and also a relapsing and remitting condition such as a serious mental illness. So that, that omission felt important. Um, what I wanted to describe was, however, what it looks like when it's done well. And this case example really stood out to us because it covers two aspects. It covers the involvement of family, but it also covers the opportunity presented by an inpatient admission. And I know, again, that some of the resistance that we've had to improving systems in physical health hospitals is that, well, you know, it's only people are only there for a short period of time, or we don't have the resource to do it, or, you know, why aren't we focusing more on community services instead? Or frankly, it's far too busy and chaotic for us to be thinking about talking to people about exercise or diet. And I think for most of us, we know that the sustainability of both physical and mental health care organizationally within our country and probably way beyond is not possible unless we focus on prevention. It really isn't. And therefore, any opportunity that we can to prevent and intervene is critical. And even if it's not seen as salient or as immediate as responding to people with the sorts of end stage um, problems that Vivek described, it's possibly one of the key things that we can do to improve the sustainability and the plausibility of us aspiring to deliver high quality care. So this 24 year old, which I'll tell you about, as I said, it was just a beautiful example. 24 year old gentleman, he had a first episode psychosis and he was poorly, he was really very unwell. There'd been an attempt at treating with a um, home treatment team, um, but it hadn't felt safe. His family had felt that they couldn't look after him um, and he was starting to, to wander and potentially becoming violent to others. So he was admitted into the ward. And he was initiated on an antipsychotic medication. And for those of you who are familiar with that sort of prescribing, you'll know that the risk of incremental weight gain over those early weeks and first year of um, antipsychotic prescribing is significant. You'll also know of the impact that it can have on glycemic control and the increased risk of diabetes purely from having an antipsychotic medication. And what was particularly important about this gentleman, or at least what the nurses and the doctors had found out, is he actually had a very extensive family history of early cardiovascular disease, and at point of admission had quite significantly raised BMI. And you might think, well, why does that wonder? What, well, um, why does that um, matter? You know, he's 24, but of course it matters because we know that he's carrying a huge number of risk factors um, for cardiometabolic disease, one of the driving factors of our 10 to 20 year mortality gap for patient, people with serious mental illness. 
So the things that were done well in this case, first of all, it was those active steps taken to formulate this gentleman's risk of cardiometabolic disease and tell him. Um, and that may sound silly, but we know from some of the, the, the patient feedback that we received is that people aren't talked to about their physical health. They're not told the risks of what it's like to take an antipsychotic medication. They're not told that, that just by definition of having a bipolar um, or a psychotic illness, they might be at higher risk of early mortality. So what stood out as good in this case is that they, they looked at this young man, they recognized that he was at increased risk and they talked to him about it and his family about it. And then what this case showed is that they gave timely, regular and accessible information to the family and they really involved the family in the prescribing decision. There was ward round notes and over a couple of sessions where they thought through with the team, the full MDT, as to what the right medication strategy was for this young man. They also supported and encouraged this young man when he was a little bit more stable in his sort of second and third week of admission to go to the gym. And what was, again, that stood out for us in the notes is it wasn't just about we need to make sure that he doesn't put on weight. There was a recognition of the interaction between his mental and his physical health and the importance of his self-esteem and his confidence and why making sure that he didn't have further weight gain and felt empowered and in control of things mattered. And what was a really nice touch that, again, is, I think, something that stood out to us with the lack of continuity and follow through, that you do something quite nice in the ward, um, but it doesn't seem to follow through into the community. For example, I think about 50% of our sample um, didn't get follow up for smoking cessation, despite being initiated on NRT in the ward. But with this case, what stood out is that people were thinking outside the ward doors very, very early on. His family got him registered with the gym, so that was all ready to go and provided a, a, a continuous care plan for him. There was an excellent handover between the ward, a home treatment team and the new care coordinator with friends and family present. So there was a sense of involvement in his care. And what particularly again stood out in terms of how this either this team or maybe this organisation prioritised is that there was opportunity for this, the family to have a session with the psychologist and the notes indicated, pointing out important things. So we know that high expressed emotion, we know that um, perhaps overzealous attempts to warn people of risks and encourage them to eat healthily, um, that can actually cause conflict in families. So they had a specific session about how you can most effectively support healthy lifestyle and behavior change in your friend and your loved one. So overall, it was a real standout of this is what good preventative, inclusive, collaborative care looks like. Um, something that I think we could take forward to probably all aspects of our care. Um, and I just wanted to wrap up with a couple of notes that, that I picked up from the, the patients in the carer surveys. And it was the words that seemed to stand out in terms of the sort of care that people wanted physically. They wanted holistic care, robust, prompt, responsive, listened to, to be followed up and to be taken seriously. And where very negative experiences of care were also shared alongside this good practice, there was something concerning, um, and you, again, you can read the report for more detail, but we heard about people being inconsistent, distracted, stressed, lacking in compassion, making, having to make repeated requests and no follow through. And there was one particular piece of feedback that sort of noted that the experience of potential burnout in mental health inpatient staff and their difficulty in connecting um, to patients and taking their physical health care seriously. So I think this walks us back to Natasha's um, original point that for all of the difficult and not ideal practice that we saw in this report, the problems lies in systems, not in individuals. And what we saw is where good care is delivered, it's hard, it's complicated because you're doing it without the necessary skills, supports and tools that you would ideally have. And so I think, and I hope this is why this report is important and why it might help focus our efforts even further on advancing the quality of care in inpatient settings because it's the requirement to change systems and skills and support staff to do that. Uh, uh, remains for me to thank, uh, obviously, Mariam, Vivek, and of course, Natasha, who, who has been online, although uh, hasn't actually been able to communicate with us directly because of the, her internet problems. But to all of you and all of the others who were involved, the many people, volunteers, both on uh, the advisory group and uh, case reviewers, uh, thank you ever so much. Uh, for, for all your uh, help and I, I hope that the recommendations in this report will lead uh, ultimately to improvement in the quality of care in this area. So thank you all very much uh, and hope you have a, a really enjoyable rest of the day.